Well, good morning, saints. It's time to start church. Don't know where everybody went, but I know. Why ain't that organ going? Better turn my phone off because I don't want no interruptions. Amen. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, we're few in number, but we're going to have a good, great spirit and a great time. Amen. If you would, let's stand. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, ask that y'all please pray for my mother. Uh, she had to come back with us from Arizona. Uh, she's having what I believe to be congestive heart failure. Got to go in tomorrow and see if they can work on the old ticker and get her tuned back up. But uh, she, need, uh, she needs prayer. And uh, y'all, please, please, please pray for Sister Heather. She got in a fight um, this past week, and she's got a big old black eye. And um, just pray that she gets better. <laughs> when you fight with three-year-olds, sometimes it's not good. Amen. Does anybody else have a prayer request you'd like for us to pray with you about? Sister Heather. Okay, let's pray for them. You have two unspoken, we don't pray for unspokens. Oh, okay, we will. We want to know. Anybody else have a prayer request? All right, let's take these needs before the Lord and just ask God to... Be with us this morning in the service. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for the day. We're so grateful, God, to you that you care about the things that trouble us. Lord, you are troubled with those things. We love you. And Lord, we just ask that you be in this service today. Allow the Spirit of God to be here and to minister to us and to help us and to strengthen us and encourage us. and Do what needs to be done in our lives. Lord, I pray this morning for my mother. I ask God that you'd touch her body. I ask God that you'd strengthen her heart. And, and uh, Lord, please allow her to have more time. And God, heal her and help her, Jesus. Lord, we lift up uh, Sister Jeanette and Chantel and Jeremiah, those that have been sick in the V Hill family. Lord, I ask that you'd touch them today. Please, Lord, help them to uh, make a turnaround and get healthy soon. Lord, I lift up uh, my wife uh, today. Uh, whatever's on her heart and her mind, I ask God that you'd strengthen and touch her and do what needs to be done and intervene, God. Please come on the scene. Lord, we just ask this morning that you would uh, work in our lives. Help us, God, to be encouraged. Help us, God, to have a new uh, uh, vigor and uh, passion to please you and to be what you want us to be. Lord, we just thank you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Steve, lead us in some singing. Maybe some more folks will come in here soon. Man, we're going to sing Change in the Twinkling of an Eye. Believe that's going to happen? Yeah. When the trump of the great archangel Its mighty tone shall sound And the end of the world proclaiming Shall pierce the depths profound When the Son of Man shall come in His glory With all the saints on high what a shouting in the skies from the multitudes that rise Changed in the twinkling of an eye 
Changed in the twinkling of an eye Changed in the twinkling of an eye The trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised Changed in the twinkling of an eye When he comes in the clouds descending And they who loved him hear from their graves shall awake and praise Him with joy and not with fear. When the body and the soul are united and clothed no more to die, what a shouting there will be when each other's face we see changed in the twinkling of an eye. Changed in the twinkling of an eye Changed in the twinkling of an eye The trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised Changed in the twinkling of an eye Oh, the seed that was sown in weakness Shall then be raised in power and the songs of the blood-bought millions Shall hail that blissful hour When we gather safely home in the morning And night's dark shadows fly What a shouting on the shore When we meet to part no more Changed in the twinkling of an eye Changed in the twinkling of an eye Changed in the twinkling of an eye The trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised Changed in the twinkling of an eye Changed in the twinkling of an eye Changed in the twinkling of an eye the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised, changed in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. And until that, until that happens, that day comes, we want Jesus to hold our hand. Amen? Amen. Or I do anyway, I think you do too. As I travel through this pilgrim land There is a friend who walks with me Leads me safely through the sinking sand It is the Christ of Calvary This would be my prayer, dear Lord Each day to help me do the best I can for I need thy light to guide me day and night. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. I need thee every hour. And through this pilgrim land, protect me by thy power. Hear my feeble plea, no oh Lord, look down on me. When I kneel in prayer, I know I'll meet you there. Bless Jesus, hold my hand. Let me travel in the light divine that I may see the blessed way. Keep me that I may be holy thine and sing redemption song someday. And I will be a soldier brave and true and ever firmly take a stand. As I onward go and daily meet the foe, blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand, I need thee every hour. 
through this pilgrim land. Protect me by thy power. Hear my feeble plea. And oh Lord, look down on me. When I kneel in prayer, I know I'll meet you there. Bless Jesus, hold my hand. When I wander through the valley, dim toward the setting of the sun, lead me safely to a land of rest to fire crown of life have won. And I have put my faith in Thee, dear Lord, that I may reach the golden strand. There's no other friend on whom I can depend. Bless Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. I need thee every hour. And through this pilgrim land, protect me by thy power. Feeble plea, and oh Lord, look down on me. When I kneel in prayer, I know I'll meet you there. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. And when I wander through the valley, dim toward the setting of the sun. Lead me safely to a land of rest to fire crown of life have won. And I have put my faith in thee, dear Lord, that I may reach the golden strand. There's no other friend on whom I can depend. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus. Jesus, hold my hand. I need thee every hour. Through this pilgrim land, protect me by thy power. Hear my feeble plea. And oh Lord, look down on me. When I kneel in prayer, I know I'll meet you there. Bless Jesus, hold my hand. Amen, amen. Thank God he wants to hold our hands. He said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. We want to say a special happy birthday to Brother Aiden, and Brother Allen, Bailey. Amen. Happy birthday, guys. Y'all uh, getting older by the minute. <laughs> Amen. Congratulations for another year of living. And uh, thank you, guys. Amen. Well, uh, quick announcement. December the 6th, Friday night, we're going to have a Christmas banquet here. And it's going to be a potluck style. And everybody's going to uh, just bring a good meal and we're going to share and have a great time. You can put you some, uh, you can wear your Christmas sweaters and haul out all that stuff, you know. And uh, we'll have us a good time. So December the 6th, Friday night. Uh, what time are we starting at? Uh, 6 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Yeah, yeah. There it is. I said 6 p.m. That was the ladies. We already had the ladies deal. Did you ladies have a good time Monday night? Those of y'all that came. Hope you all enjoyed it. Anyway, be sure to remember December the 6th. Brother Wells, if you'd come and help us receive the offering. Amen. Alan's had a birthday, so he has to stand up here in front of everybody on, on his birthday. <laughs> Amen. Please be faithful to give to the Lord's work. And um, God will bless you for it. Amen. Brother Wells, pray, please, if you would.
Thank you for giving. Amen. And for those of you that didn't hear, Brother Ty and Brother Josh killed them an elk this week. So congratulations to them. Oh, it's Hasiel. Oh, Hasiel and Joshua. Well, Hasiel, congratulations. He's the, he's the great hunter. Amen. Well, Brother Steve, lead, uh, sing us a song if you would, please. I mean, I'm going to sing that I could still go free today. Worship the Lord. Maybe I will. What kind of man 
still go free. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like for you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. I'm going to read several scriptures today, but um, I think that you will get the gist pretty quickly um, where we're going with this. Stand if you would, please. Proverbs 3, verse 5, the Bible says, To trust in the Lord. With all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. If the Lord will help me today, I want to talk to you for a little bit on the thought of getting a better understanding. Getting a better understanding understanding. Heavenly Father, I ask today that you'd make me a blessing to your people. Let it be, God, when we leave here that we would have been uh, encouraged and challenged and strengthened. And Lord, let it be that we would be better Christians as a result of it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Getting a better understanding. I'm going to read you just some scriptures, then I'm going to make a couple of comments before we get into the message. In Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 21, the Bible says, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes. And then in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, the Bible says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, which ye should be wise in your own conceit. That blindness in part has happened to Israel and to the fullness of the Gentiles become in. 
The Bible warns us of conceit. The Bible warns us of thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought. And the Bible warns us of being wise in our own eyes. You hear people say things like, well, I would have done that. Or I'd have done it differently. And they're very, very, very quick to give their two cents as to how someone else made a mistake. And how someone else mess things up. Well, if they'd have just done it like I do it. And um, sometimes that's true. And sometimes that's not true. The Bible talks about even the Apostle Paul says, now we see through a glass darkly. We see in part and we know in part there's some things we just don't understand fully yet, right? And sometimes we're quick to make judgments about things that we really don't have all the facts on. I, um, I thought the best illustration of this would be to briefly remind you of that story that we heard years ago about the man that was on the airplane and he had a couple of kids, and they were being very unruly, a two-year-old, maybe a two- and a four-year-old or something of that nature. And people in the plane were looking around, and it had gotten to where that, you know, he was getting looks and, and uh, shaking heads and various things. And finally, some person had the courage to, st to, to ask, What's going on with your kids? And he said, yeah, I'm sorry. And he bowed his head and he said, we just, we just buried their mother. And they're having a hard time coping with what's going on. And how the paradigm shift now instead of frustration and anger, it turned immediately to compassion and mercy. Because they needed a better understanding of what was really going on. Right? And uh, I, I, when I, this week when I was reading my Bible, I ran across a scripture that we'll read later uh, about ceasing from our own wisdom. But um, sometimes things are not as they seem. Right? The Bible says there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There's sometimes we get to thinking in a vein, and we get to thinking in a way that it seems right. It seems like this would be the right choice. But really that may lead to death. I, um, well, I don't, I don't have time to, to, to take side roads today, but the uh, second thing I'd like to make mention, first was sometimes things are not as they seem, but secondly, we should never start to think that it's our wisdom and that it's our strength and that it's our riches that's making the difference. In Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 23, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, let, no, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. We need to always be able to say, It's the Lord that has been merciful. It has the Lord that has enlightened. It has the Lord that has strengthened. It is the Lord that has made rich. God gets the credit, amen? If you have a, a sound mind today, if you have an ability to think, and uh, that comes from God, amen? In Him we live and move and have our being. The first Part of having a better understanding is to understand that every good and perfect gift comes from God. Amen. So we look to God to have our understanding enlightened. Because how many of you know if we lean to our own understanding 
it'll lead to decay and corruption. Back to our text, lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Amen. So first of all, sometimes things are not as they seem. Amen. Because there are ways that seem right, but they lead to death. And sometimes, uh, or all the time, we should realize that our strength and our wisdom and our riches come from, from, from the Lord. And then thirdly, what is the greatest contribution that someone could ever make to another human being? It's to help them make heaven. In Proverbs 3 and verse 7 says, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Be not wise in thine own eyes. How many of you know that the devil is leading people that are good intending, well-meaning people astray? They feel as though they're doing things the right way. How many times have you ever heard someone say, well, I'm, uh, I'm just uh, doing my best. I'm, I'm doing my best. As if to say, this is the path that's before me and I'm just walking in the best I know how and that's got to be good enough. Do you know today that there are well-meaning, good-intentioned people that are going to hell. You can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. There are people strapping bombs on themselves and walking into cafes and blowing themselves up for a religion. We need a better understanding. The best contribution that we could ever make to, to another person is help show them the way to Jesus. Help show them the way to heaven. There are a lot of people today, I, 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 I believe this about people, there are a lot of people that uh, they're trying to be good parents, right? They're, they're trying to be good employees. They're trying to just get through life. But they need a better understanding. It's not to say that the understanding that they have now is they're willfully being deceived and they're willfully, they know better, they just don't want to do. There's a lot of people that just need a better understanding. I fit into that category this morning. I am fully aware that there are things that I do not know enough about to make wise decisions. I fully understand that there are things about life and about relationships and even my spiritual life that I have not come to a full enough understanding yet. Have you ever felt frustration in your life knowing that there was an answer to whatever you were facing but you could not get your mind around it? You could not grasp it. I have. I have. Uh, computers is one of those things for me. Computers, you talk to a computer geek, and what is their famous line? Oh, it's easy. That's easy. Well, it's easy if you know what button to push. But it ain't easy if you don't know what button to push. Right? It's easy if you have the understanding and the concept of how it works. But if you don't know... It's not easy. And life is difficult many times because we lack understanding or we need a better understanding. I remember when we were raising our children. We had Josh and uh, Josh was compliant. He was good. And then he started getting opinions. And he started having an attitude. And it became evident to Sister Mary and I very quickly that we needed help. If Josh was going to turn out good, we needed a better understanding of how to be parents. And we sought out books. We sought out uh, teachings. We listened to older people. We read the Bible. 
we applied ourselves because we felt like the stakes were very, very, very high. We didn't want to raise a drug addict. We didn't want to raise a child that we had to bail out of jail. We wanted to raise a good human. We wanted to raise a Christian boy. We wanted, we wanted that, that boy to go to heaven. And, and, and so, man, when we would, uh, I remember one time, you know, one of the very first things that new parents have to learn is that distinct cry. You know, that, that cry between they're hurting or they're just mad cry, right? Uh, and I'll never forget, Josh was probably, uh, he wasn't probably maybe three months old, four months old. And uh, my wife was, uh, uh, we, we were all both new at this, and, and he would cry. And we had one of them swings. I don't know if y'all remember them kind of swings that you wind up, you know, and click, 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 click. And, and then, boy, we was really in high cotton when you got one you could plug in the wall, you know, and it, it'd swing. And anyway, I remember one night uh, Josh was crying, and, um, and we knew he was just mad. And uh, it, you go through this whole deal of, you know, uh, well, he's going to stay in there till he gets over it. He's just going to cry it out, you know. And then, it, and then it turns into, well, he's getting on my nerves, and i got to do something about it. And I remember we were laying in bed, and, and he was in the living room, and he was crying, and he was crying. And it seemed like it was an hour, but I'm sure it was probably five minutes, you know. Uh, and Mary said, well, should I go get him? And I said, leave him alone. Leave him alone. And sure enough, in about 15, 20 minutes, he, he simmered down and went to sleep, and everything was good. But uh, it, it, I, I'll, I'll never forget feeling like, man, we don't have any clue of what we're doing here. And God entrusted us with a human, <laughs> you know? How in the world is this going to work out? Uh, and so we need a better understanding. Amen. Now, let me get to the meat of, of the message. And that is that this world is programming us. Whether we realize it and are aware of it or not, this world in society and culture is programming us. It's programming us to think a certain way. It's programming us to react in, in certain ways. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 18, the Bible says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. In verse, four, verse 19, it says, For this for the wisdom of this world. What is the wisdom? I got to thinking, what is the wisdom and how are we being uh, programmed? Uh, wh one thing is uh, we're being programmed to equate success with wealth instead of purpose. Our society is painting these pictures to us all the time that people, if they've got a lot of money, that somehow means that they're successful. And we know with our mind that that's not true. Right? We know that the, that the movie stars that are married four and five times and, and they're in and out of rehabs. and I mean, their lives aren't put together. Right? They, they drive their uh, $200,000 car, but they're miserable. And they're c killing themselves. And funny man, Robin Williams, hanging himself. We, we know that that's not true with our mind, but nonetheless we're being programmed continuously. All the imagery, all of the, all of the facade is telling us to, in order to be successful, you have to be wealthy. And so what do we do? We all light into trying to be wealthy. We all light into making more, 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 more. And we sacrifice time with our children. We sacrifice vacations. We, we, we sacrifice our morals. We sacrifice ethics. We sacrifice our soul many times in order to obtain more, 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 more. 
Wouldn't it be great if our understanding could get so strengthened in, in reality that we could ward off all of this imagery and this, and this messaging that we're, that we're constantly battling? Wouldn't it be great if we could get a better understanding of what real success is? Amen. I, uh, I, I gave a lot of thought to that a few years ago and came up with my own definition of success. And I simply is, if I can die, having the people that know me the best, love and respect me the most, I will have died a successful man. Because really, people's opinion that don't know me, why in the world would I let that affect me? Right? Why would I let society put the pressure on me to have a certain amount in my bank at the expense. Did you know I, I came across something this past year? I, I was studying this out. Do you know that entrepreneurs, 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 uh, people, whenever they start a business and their net worth, not their gross, but their net worth gets over a million dollars, their marriages end in divorce almost 80% of the time. That to me don't sound like success. I mean, if the people that are the closest to you that's supposed to love you the most and you love them the most, if they want to walk away from you and not be around you and not have relationship with you, that, does not, that doesn't sound like success to me. I need a better understanding of what success is. Amen? The Bible says... In Proverbs 23 and verse 4, Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own understanding. Well, you might say, well, if I'm not laboring to get rich, what in the world am I laboring for? Why should a Christian labor? Well, there's several things you should labor for. You should labor, labor to provide for your family. You should labor to be a Christian example to those around you. You should labor to give God your best. You should labor because laboring is good for your purpose. But you should not labor to be rich. You should cease from that wisdom. That wisdom that's trying to program you that success is being wealthy. It's not. The world is programming us to equate respect with positions and not being a person of character. The world is programming people to think that in order, the way you get respect is to get a title. You're the boss. You're the owner of the business. You're the doctor. You got, you got letters behind your name or in front of your name. When in reality, that is not what should produce respect in a person or for a person. If you keep your word, if you show up when you say you're supposed to, you do a good job, you tell the truth, you treat people fairly, you represent Jesus well, that's where you should get your respect from, not because you've got some title. Titles are so deceptive. I, this is what I've learned about people. You give them a title, and boy, there's not many people that can handle a title. I know that Brother Allen could probably testify to this. You, you get a guy on a paving crew, and that guy works really hard, and he shows a little initiative, and he's really eager to do a good job, and he gets promoted to foreman. That leap from laborer to, to, to foreman, boy, that needs to come with a lot of training. 
Because more often than not, the minute that that person becomes the foreman, it ain't many people that can handle power or authority. Right? We see it happen all the time. It goes to their head. Now that they got a title, boy, I, I'm going I'm to whip y'all in shape. Don't you remember just two weeks ago you was right here with this shovel with me? And so what happens is they alienate everybody that they're now over because the title went to their head. And they thought, boy, I'm going to demand respect. You don't demand respect. You earn respect. Amen? Amen? You can't boss people into respecting you. You can boss people in, in because their fear of getting fired and their fear of losing their paycheck. They, they, may, they, may con, they may control some of their conduct, but the only way you're going to gain respect and, and, and loyalty out of people is prove you care about them. Amen. Amen. But the world is programming us. You're hearing me this morning. The world is programming us to think to climb the corporate ladder. That's where it's really at. If you really want to be respected, man, get a title. And in reality, that's not what respect is about in the, very, in the least. The world is programming us to equate success with wealth, respect with position. The world is programming us to equate greatness with being served. In Mark chapter 9, verse 35, And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. In Matthew 20 and verse 25, But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of, this, of, the, of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Amen. Amen. And I want to say to you folks this morning, I do not view myself as a over you or lording over you or above you in any sense of the word. God has called me to be your minister. That's to try to meet the spiritual need that you have. God has called me to try and help you in your walk with God and your journey toward heaven. That's it. I so appreciate it and I was so humbled by you all a few weeks ago giving us a pastor's appreciation. And I thank you so, so, so much for that. I really, really do. But I'm humbled because... I'm not any better than any of you. I'm not above you. I'm not over you. I'm your minister. Amen. And it's that voluntary servitude that should inspire us all to do better. It's that voluntary willingness to put myself under that's what God is viewing as greatness. Do you see the difference between what the world is trying to program us to? Oh, that person must be really important. Look how everybody's uh, taking care of their needs and serving them. And it should be that we're wanting to meet the needs of others. I, I give honor today to Brother Wells. Brother Wells, I know he doesn't want me to say this. This is not what he's striving for at all. But Brother Wells... He, he looks for the needs to serve his brothers and sisters. Every time he's around, if he doesn't have to be told, hey, if there's a little ice spot out there, uh, he's, he's getting it. If, if someone looks like they need help or they need a, uh, you know, something, he's, he's on it. 
And it should be that in all of our hearts, we ought to love and appreciate Brother Wells because he's willing to serve us. He doesn't get any accolades for that. He, he's doing it out of a pure heart. I, I'd, I'd like to, today to brag on my president just a minute. I really would. Uh, I know we mentioned it here, but some of you may not, may not have heard it. Uh, a few weeks ago, there were some missionary friends of ours that uh, did a work down in Haiti. And uh, the Lloyds, uh, the two young, two young missionaries got killed. And the, the girl, uh, her, her uh, dad is a, uh, just a low-level a low representative, Republican in, in southwest Missouri. And uh, this is back when Trump was, was having to be uh, in court because of all these accusations that made on him. He's having to be in court and set hours every day and trying to run a campaign. But uh, he had to be in court the next morning. He had to be up at 6 o'clock. And that night when the news came on that those two young missionaries got killed, uh, Donald Trump called Ben Baker and stayed on the phone with him probably 10 minutes just offering his condolences and, uh, and caring about him, uh, about them. And that's right in the middle of him being attacked. No, that, that wasn't picked up by one news media. If I, if I hadn't known people that know them firsthand, I would have never heard of that. That, did, that, didn't, that never got reported at all. You want to be great? Care for the needs of other people. Amen. I, I saw a story. Donald Trump had a building in New York that they was remodeling. This little black lady uh, had snuck in that building and she was living in there. And uh, Donald Trump come through and he saw what was going on. And he told all of his workers, he said, she'll be the last one to leave. He, he made sure she had heat. And for two years while they was remodeling that building, he allowed her a place to stay. They tried to interview her when they was talking about, you know, Donald Trump's kicking all these people out. She said, I ain't got nothing bad to say about him. She said, he knows I'm here and he's taking care of me. Hey, I'm just telling you, friend, if you want to be great, you got to be willing to be the servant. If you own a business... Amen. Care for your employees. Don't, don't view them as, as less than you. They're just as important as you are. Amen. Amen. I'm saying the world is programming us to think that wealth equals success. It's programming us to think that respect is position. It's programming us to think that greatness is being served and not serving the world is programming us to think that pride is better than humility. Proverbs 26 and 12. Listen to this verse. This is a powerful verse. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. I'm talking to you this morning about God. Give me a better understanding. Give me a better way of thinking. Give me, enlighten me to not get sucked into this, this philosophy that the world is trying to pull us all into. There's a fine, 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 fine line between being, having self-worth and pride. You ought to look your best and you ought to dress your best and you ought to wash your car and clean your house and you ought to be respectable because you're, you feel as though you're representing God. But you need to be keenly aware that that never, never cross over into pride or feeling that I'm better than somebody else. Romans twelve sixteen. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, be, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. 
And last of all, the world is programming us. And listen to this. What did our text verse say? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. I want you to think about that a minute. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. There is nobody that we trust in with all of our heart. I want you to think about that. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And he connected that to lean not to your own understanding. Listen to this. The world is programming us to trust in our heart. The Bible says in Proverbs 28 and 26, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. My heart can be affected easily. It can be swayed by emotion. My heart can get sucked into uh, a, a smooth talking, logical person that has wicked intent. I can be supporting things before I, before I know it if I trust in my heart alone. Amen? I've, I've heard some Democrats talk, and when they got done talking, I said, well, I agree with that. I agree with all of that. Because it sounded good. Old Bill Clinton, you listen to Bill Clinton talk, and you'll think, man, that guy, that's why they called him Slick Willie. Right? If I, if, I, if I had the time, I'd have y'all look up right now on Google how many people have mysteriously died around the Clintons. I had Brother Noah look it up uh, the other day. or, or ask, Actually, I think it was two nights ago he looked it up. And I think it was 47 people. You don't have 47 mysterious friends that die mysteriously that you know. Nobody does that. Right? But I'm telling you, if you rely on your own heart and your own ears, if that's all you're making decisions on, the world is programming people to trust their heart. Well, just follow your heart. That's the dumbest advice ever. Well, the heart don't choose who it loves. Yes, it does. Amen. You don't trust your heart. Your heart is desperately wicked. Well, you might say, well, Brother Gary, if I can't trust my heart, then what can I trust? The Spirit. Right. Hallelujah. Yes. Walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. You can trust the Word of God. Amen. If Jesus said it, you can trust that. Yes. Amen. This last several years, fake news, misinformation, you don't know what you're looking at. And now, did you know with AI, they said within two years there will not be a photograph or a video admissible in a court of law. Because AI is getting so good, you don't know what you're looking at, if it's real or if it's fake. So how are we going to discern? How are we going to get a better understanding? So how do I get a better understanding? Number one, and this is the meat of the message, three simple points. Please listen, and I'll be done here very, very, very shortly. Number one, if you're going to get a better understanding, you have to have a teachable spirit. A teachable spirit. In Hosea six and, 4 and 6, it says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because... Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, 
that thou shalt not Y'all shall be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of God. I will also forget thy children. God said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And it wasn't because knowledge was not available. It was not because knowledge was not taught. It was not because knowledge was not uh, given or administered. It was because they rejected knowledge. I have tried to counsel people before that I knew that, that what I was telling them was scripturally sound, it was right, it would work, it was good advice. But they rejected it. That's, uh, that's an, my next point, be willing to take advice. Have a teachable spirit and be willing to take advice. Don't be quick to find excuses and reasons why it won't work for you or why you're the exception to the rule. Amen? If God tells you something about how to raise your kids, then say, let God be true and every man be a liar. Amen. Amen. Every man be a liar. I don't care if every psychologist in America says, don't spank your children. God's word said, if you love them, you'll beat them with a rod. Amen. Right. You talk, I talked about my, my wife and I. We had, to make, we had to come to some of these decisions of how, to, how we were going to raise our children. That was one of the scriptures we came across. Obviously, the Bible's not talking about abuse. Obviously, the Bible's not talking about a big person beating up on a little person. What's the principle? What's the principle? We read another scripture where the Bible says, when the judgments of the Lord are not executed speedily, men's heart are set in them to do evil. And what happens in the conscience when someone does something wrong and they don't have to pay for it and they feel like they got away with it? Then there's a moral dilemma in a child's heart and in the conscience and the mind. And if that conscience is never cleared up, then that child just reverts into secretness. And they become sneaky. Or they act out. So that God had a principle. That principle works. And if you have the courage and say, God, I want a better understanding of how to apply this principle in our lives. You can raise godly kids. You can raise good, raise good kids. But if you listen to what the world is saying, oh, they just need time out. There's an appropriate time for a time out. But there's also when there's willful rebellion and stubbornness. There's a time to break a paddle out and to bring correction and clear that child's conscience to where that they can have re, re, a, a renewed fellowship, a reconciling of fellowship. I told Josh, Josh, don't do that. And Josh wasn't rebellious, but there were times where he waited out and he said, he knew. Dad said, don't do it. I did it anyway. And I'd say, son, why'd you do that? Did you, did you hear me tell you? Yes, I heard you tell me. Well, you know you have to get a spanking. And we were consistent. My dad always said, if you tell a child you're going to get them an ice cream, you get them an ice cream. If you tell them you're going to give them a spanking, you give them a spanking. Don't ever spank your children. And this is just a little pastoral. I don't know why I'm going down this line. I'm talking to you about taking advice, though. But don't, 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 ever, don't ever discipline your children in anger. I remember one time I made my dad mad. I made him so mad he didn't talk to me for three days. And after he got his spirit under control, I got my whipping. But he refused to discipline me in anger because he didn't want it to be a big person beating up on a little person. When he told me he was going to give me a spanking, I had a spanking coming. That might be in an hour. That might be in a day. That might be three days. But I had a spanking coming. Amen. Where did my dad come up with those things? From the Word of God. Amen. He, he, he wanted to be a good parent. And by the way, 
just because he spanked me. I heard one comedian say, why is it that all these kids being raised now and never got a spanking from their kids are growing up, growing up and hating their parents? And he said, all of us that were beat to, de beat to death by our parents, we grew up and honored our parents. He said, how in the world did that work? Because there's something about us. We want to, be, we want to know we're loved to an, enough that we know we can't, we can't uh, get away with wrongdoing. Our conscience has to be cleared. I'm just telling you, brothers and sisters, we need a better way. We need a better way to understand how to parent. We need a better way to understand how to be a spouse. Amen? And, and, the, and the real question is, is how's it working out for society? When we forget God, when we walk away and start leaning to our own understanding. And I read this book, and it sounded so good. The Bible says wisdom is justified in her children. Stick around and see how it's playing out. And I'm just saying that God's ways work. God's ways work. Amen. I grew up and loved the God of my mom and dad. I love my mom and dad. I honor them. I bless them. Amen. I, 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 I wanted their God because they tried to do it godly. My kids, I believe I can still say that all of them still love me. You guys still love me? Thanks, Braden. I would ask my wife if she did, but I'd, that's too much of a risk. <laughs> We need a better understanding. I believe with all my heart the reason that God wanted me to preach this to us today was not to say that we're, we're losers, to not to say that we, uh, we're, we're totally walking in darkness. It's just simply to say to us, hey, stay hungry for truth. Stay hungry for the best in the right way. Desire to be enlightened. Desire, Paul said, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. He was longing. He said, I give up everything and I count it but dung that I may know him. Amen. Amen. I know that my understanding is, is lacking. I know that, my, that, that the reality that I see, although it's, uh, it's right in some ways, there could be more. And the last thing I'll say to this is this. How do I get a better understanding? I, number one, have a teachable spirit. Number two, I'd be willing to take advice. And three, and finally, and I believe this is the, the biggest key right here, bathe yourself in the Word of God. Bathe yourself in the Word of God. Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And that's what the Lord was saying in Ephesians 5 there, the way he views his church, his bride. That he may sanctify and cleanse it. The church, Jesus is wanting to sanctify and cleanse the church. He's wanting to sanctify. What is to sanctify? To set apart. That's where he said, come out from among the world and be separate. You ought to dress separately than the world. You ought to participate in different things than the world. You ought to sing different songs than the world. You ought to be different than the world. Come out from among them and be you separate. He wants to sanctify you and then cleanse you with the washing of water by the word. If you're not keeping up with your Bible reading, oh, I challenge you and I plead with you. Get back on track. Read the Bible every, every day. Read the Bible every day. When you read the Bible, ask God to open your mind and open your spirit to receive the Word of God. Let it cleanse you. Oh, I, I, don't, know if, I don't know how to explain this to you. I don't know how to, how to put it into words. But if, if you let the Word of God just flow over you, there's a cleansing effect that takes place in your mind and in your spirit. The Word of God can wash out all that worldly teaching and all that worldly thinking and all that worldly philosophy and all that, that, that programming that the world has tried to do. The Word of God can give you a different 
way of thinking. It can enlighten you. And, and there'll be times you'll say, I never saw that before. That makes perfect sense now. Oh, my understanding has been enlightened and I have a better understanding now. Because the Word of God, I, I, I said to you guys a few months ago, life's a lot about connecting the dots. And things that we don't think are related many times are. And, and, and because you can't connect the dots, many times you make wrong decisions. But oh, when the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, starts to enlighten your understanding, you say, oh, now I know what He meant when He said that. Now I know what that meant. and That makes perfect sense now. And I get the principle now. And I don't just see the words, but I understand the heart of God. And I know what God was trying to say to me. And I know what God was trying to, He, he wanted for me in my life. And, and I thank God. But all that comes through the Word of God. And there's no shortcuts to it. Preaching is not a, a, a seven-step program to success. Amen? Amen? Preaching is not motivational speaking, although there's elements of motivation in it. Preaching is to elevate the Word of God above my understanding, above your understanding, above your life and my life, and say that God's Word can transform a life. Most of the messages that you guys get is through me in my Bible reading coming across a scripture that leaps off the page, Sister Betty, and something happens in my spirit. And then I just start meditating on it. And God starts enlarging it. I mean, this little old message that I'm preaching to you this morning about a better understanding. I read that one scripture there. It says, labor not to be rich, but cease from your own, under, your own wisdom. That one scripture just, just led me down a whole path of why does my wisdom, why doesn't my wisdom meet the grade? And why do I need to have my understanding enlightened? And all of this came about just because I was reading my Bible. And now I have something to sincerely pray about and say, God, I don't want to trust my heart. I don't want to trust my mind. I want to trust you. I want you to enlighten me. I realize, Lord, that I could ever be learning and never come into the knowledge of the truth. There's a lot of educated idiots Amen? Just because somebody's smart, just because somebody can talk eloquently, that does not mean that they're, they're discerning truth, does not mean that they are pleasing God, and it doesn't mean that they're going to heaven. Amen? Now, there's no, there, there's no, there's no virtue in being dumb either. Amen? So I'm not saying just be ignorant. I'm saying you need to learn what you need to learn by the Word of God. The Bible says learn not the way of the heathen. Amen? There are some things you do not need to know. You don't, you don't need to learn uh, how to talk like a gang member to reach a gang member. Amen? You don't have to dress like a harlot to reach a harlot. Amen? Amen? But you do need to know the Word of God. And you need to love the Word of God if your understanding is to be enlightened. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you to prayer. Listen to me. Give me, give, me, give me two minutes. Two minutes. I'll be done in two minutes. I promise. I'll be done in two minutes. The application to this message is this. Do you know everything you need to know? Do you understand everything you need to understand? To get where you need to go and to be what you need to be. Do you sense a hunger to want to understand better? Do you have a real longing to be more pleasing to God? I spent the whole first half of this message talking about 
Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't think you're something when you're not. Take an honest assessment of where you are. And I've told you, I did not intend this message to be condemning to you. I'm not meaning to put you under pressure. I'm just simply saying there's more to know. There's more to understand. And if we sincerely desire it, God said in His Word in James, if you lack wisdom, ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Because he that wavers is like the wave of the sea. He's driven to and fro. So how hungry are you to understand a better way? To have a better understanding. Stand with me if you would.